Um, so my name is Daniel Tucker, and I have the pleasure of interviewing John Kinsman today. And uh, I've had the the pleasure also of getting to have a lot of uh, chats with John over the years. And um, so this is the, the result of some of those conversations. Um, so we're gonna go through about six questions um, that kind of touch on different aspects of John's work. Um, but I just want to, to make sure everyone here knows before we dive into it, John is a Wisconsin dairy farmer uh, for his whole life and has been involved with very local social movements as well as extremely global um, social movements and activism. And so that's some of the, the, the range of activity that we're going to try and touch on. Um, so the first questions I've got for John uh, relate to kind of life on the farm and his farming practices. Uh, the first one I've got, John, is your parents farmed during the Great Depression. You've said it was easier for farmers then than it is for farmers now. Why is that? At that time, we were diversified farmers. We had cows, pigs, chickens. Uh, we raised wheat, oats, hay, barley. And when we didn't have enough money to buy the wonderful white bread, sliced white bread, <laughs> we had to eat whole wheat bread. My dad took it to the mill, the wheat, and ground it. And we hated it. Now we love it. And we're looking for it all over. So that's part of, um, of how uh, how we live, but it, it was not a problem. And it was a leisurely life, believe it or not. Uh, we never worked on Sunday. Nobody in the family had to work out to support the farm. The farm now is, a, is almost a hobby for most people. They, both the, the man and the woman have to get a job to support, we call it their hobby. Uh, so, but my, uh, my, Parents were able to go to the World's Fair in Chicago in 1933. And this was during the Depression. And I remember my grandmother came and took care of us. So I was, uh, I forget how old, but not old enough to run the farm. And so they, they did that. My, gra my grandparents went to California. And I have a picture of my grandmother with goggles on. She, she, she and Grandpa were went on a flight in an open cockpit plane in California and so on. Well, anyway, it was a, a more leisurely time. And so, uh, and we, we ate, I had, ber we ate berries every day. So we picked berries, wild berries and a few tame ones. Uh, I remember the gooseberries especially, they were prickly. And, and uh, but my mother canned them and now we know that berries are very healthy. So we had berries for almost twice a day, and the year round, either fresh or canned. And so it, it, was, it was a good life, in spite of so-called depression. So um, I have to look at my notes, otherwise I'm going to get off on a tangent. Well, so, something else I wanted to ask you that relates to, to the kind of farming practice that you've um, Develop today and still maintain on your farm in Wisconsin is that um, you've said that you agree with a, a recent UN report um, that said supporting this is a quote low carbon and resource preserving smallholder farms is the only kind of agriculture that will cool the planet. Referencing global warming, uh, you farm you farmed organically since the 60s, but you didn't always. Can you talk about your transition to organic farming and what you've learned from this approach to agriculture? Uh, certainly. Uh, the UW-Madison, the College of Agriculture, was the best friend of, of myself and my father because of speaking out for diver diversified farming and conservation and all this. And so as time went on, it was like, uh, Things were changing. They were getting into technologies that we had questions about, but we thought we had to do it. You know the story of, of the frog. You put the frog in, in water and, and you turn up the heat a little bit and you do a little bit more, and pretty soon the frog is boiled and it doesn't even know it. And this kind of happened to us. And I started using some herbicides. 
thinking, well, this will save me a lot of time. Yeah. And I ended up in the university hospital with some serious problems. They would never say what it was because of the research going on. And But the doctor said, your name, what's your occupation? Farmer. When is the last time you use herbicides or pesticides? And the same with the med students that examined me. It was the same thing. Exactly. So I knew what it was, but they and never once in the records or anything said what it was. And these were herbicides that they had given you? Is that right? This was what they promoted at the university. And then we started looking. That's when I became organic overnight. That's almost 50 years ago. And so, uh, well, I was in that direction, but we were led away from it by the, by the, uh, the research. We didn't know that the research was being funded by these chemical companies and, and the rest. So we did a FOIA search at one time and found out a lot of things of how that directed what was coming out of the College of Agriculture. And so can you say a little bit more, just give us a, a bit of a sense of kind of what you, your farm is like and what your farming practices are like? Yes. Uh, what was not mentioned, I can relate to the woman that just passed away, because my passion is tree planting and farming. Because I'm a sustainable farmer, tree farmer, and my family and I have planted over 100,000 trees. But we have no place to plant anymore because every inch that could be planted a tree is planted already. So it's just a joy to, to see what that does to the environment and becomes the most valuable part of land that never should have been cleared and so on. So that's part of it. Uh, what, what was the rest of the question? And then uh, tell us a little bit about your dairy operation. Okay. We, uh, we have 36 cows and we maintain that number. And uh, it's a intensive rotational grazing. My cows get fresh pasture, green grass, and clover every 12 hours. And if they don't get it, they complain. <laughs> so, but they spread the manure. They spread the fertilizer. And they carry the milk in, and they carry the fertilizer out. So we have a very low carbon footprint. Many farmers especially the factory farms, think I'm not a farmer. In fact, the, the UW College of Agriculture doesn't consider me a farmer because I'm not running the tractor 12, 14 hours a day, and, but my cows are doing the work. And, and that's where the, the cheese you had and so on today, that came from my cows. And so, go ahead. Yeah. So I want to I want to um, step back again in history a little bit and talk about uh, some of your relationship to to civil rights activism and, and anti-racist activism in, throughout the U.S. And, and in Wisconsin in particular. Um, Project Self Help and Awareness, or PSA, is a 40-year-old organization that you became involved in very early on and played a lead role in. You joined after your son did an exchange program where he traveled to the South as a college student. And subsequently, you coordinated other white Wisconsin families to host a visiting, uh, hundreds of uh, visiting black uh, children or teenagers um, from Mississippi for three weeks every summer. This is an ongoing program. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the motivation behind these exchanges, this exchange program, and how it related to the civil rights movement? Well, it was the other way around. Uh, we got the children first, and my son was a college student. He was so impressed to be able to have two young, uh, young men and a young woman who were probably seven and 10 in our home for three weeks that he had to see more. So then he went to Mississippi with a man who, who began this project, which was the aftermath of the civil rights movement. And it was actually 45 years ago. And a black woman, Beulah Washington, who hosted this man, Mel Gisson, who was a university student, who was on one of the Freedom Riders and suffered a lot. And she said, Mel, we can't, we can't end this here. We have to 
we have to continue in some way because this is the first time my children have ever had a good relationship with white people. And so they, they then hatched this plan, which was excellent. And after about, we were in the second year, and after that, it became so, so difficult, he turned it all over to me. <laughs> and so it was, it was very difficult. We did 12 round trips with an old school bus that we refurbished to, to bring these children, matched with coordinators in Wisconsin, with coordinators in, in Mississippi, to give them an experience that would raise their self-esteem. And that was the whole, the whole part of it, was to make them feel good about themselves and, and to not be a handout. It was a solidarity. It was a, 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 a way to, to raise, to make them feel that they were equal and that they could do anything if it, and if they wanted. And the poverty was so great the first time I was there, I stayed in a home in Carroll County in the, in the hills. Uh, part of the house had a dirt floor. There were uh, no electricity. And this was typical of many of the rural people. And so I learned a lot. I cried a lot, too. But you don't, you don't uh, make friends by crying. So they said, well, why are you laughing? I said, you want to see me cry? <laughs> So it was, it was tremendous, and, to, and so these 12 round trips would bring these children up and we started taking adults down and college students uh, and extra to, to do Head Start work and just to, to, to immerse themselves. That's the only way. You can't explain it, of how great it is, and, and uh, I would say the courage and the uh, joy that these, the most poverty stricken state in the Union in some of the most poverty-stricken counties, and some of them still are, uh, to see how these people can celebrate and make you feel good. And uh, you told me a story about how this was kind of transformative for you and an uh, ex exchange you had with a woman named Rosie. Rosie May Hosey, I think right. was her name. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> What, what did Rosie say to you? That well, R Rosie, uh, I'm trying, uh, Art Hackett is a public television producer in Wisconsin. And so he wanted to, to document some of the things I was talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. And so he went to Mississippi. I was not with him. And Rosie, <laughs> Rosie was one of the people that her children came. To, to, to the Wisconsin. She lived a very tough life. Uh, just an example of what she lived. One of my neighbors hosted some of her children and uh, she went and stayed with Rosie for two days. And for breakfast, uh, Rosie borrowed a hot plate from a neighbor and warmed up some fat back. And then for, for the noon lunch, they went to a local Jitney Jr. and divided a, a bag of Cheetos. Well, anyway, Rosie was always a happy person and just a great person to be with. So Art Hackett interviewed Rosie, and I saw the, the documentary film that he did. And in it, Rosie, he asked questions and said, well, who are the white people that you got to know? And she went on and named a few. And then there was John Kinsman, but no, he's one of us. <laughs> and that was, one, I'll never forget that, so one of the greatest compliments I ever had, you know, among others, but that was one of the greatest. Just, so. Yeah, that's great. Um, so uh, when, when we talked on the phone, you were, you were telling me a little bit about your ancestry and saying that, that your ancestors were settlers, and, uh, and that, was not, that was something that you were critical about. Um, and, and since you've, you've done work in Wisconsin to defend native land and farm sovereignty, uh, can you give us an example of these experiences? Uh, well, my great-grandparents came by covered wagon and oxen from the east, and they settled. But when I think about it now, there were people there. Uh, they were settlers. And uh, I mean, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, 
and they took the land. The native people now and all over the world uh, are the land grabbing is going on. That was land grabbing also, but it was not named that. And of course, they were savages. Uh, in my grandmother's diary, she and her younger sister, who was Jeanette, was 16. My grandmother had just married. She was probably 20 or 21. They were going from one area to another, and a band of Indians had moved in. And they went down to talk to them twice. They, they had no fear of these savages, <laughs> or so-called. So it was interesting, but they were still settlers. But that's beside the point, what, what, what I'm saying. But anyway, so what I learned in going back and forth hundreds of times and breaking down along the way uh, with this bus, we drove it, my daughter drove it, my daughter-in-law, my son, my son repaired it. And we had to keep this old bus going to keep these, these, these exchanges going. And it, it was, it's quite an experience to break down the bus break down completely and, and you have to go to a rest stop and, and try to overhaul it and the only thing you had to eat was watermelon. I never ate so, I got so tired of watermelon in my life that you tried to get this bus back. Another bus came down and picked up the kids and one of the drivers for this, yeah, and I had to get it back to Chicago where he lived. But, so it was an eye opener. And then I could see, I could, I could see my own neighborhood and, and the north better than what we were doing to our local people, the native people and my neighbors. Everything took a different perspective. All my friends, not all of them, most of them changed. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> we were wasting a lot of time with a lot of people that had nothing to offer and refused to have something to offer. So then we had real friends of, of real people that we could now see. So, and, uh, and what were some of the exchanges or activism you had around uh, native land in Wisconsin? Well, we, uh, the Crandon Mine was a, a big mine about 10 years ago proposed by Exxon in uh, native land in northern Wisconsin. And it, it would destroy their wild rice beds and the headwaters, headwaters of a of a beautiful river that went through the reservation and it, it was de very destructive. So we did a uh, sort of a hearing and I represented the farmers of North America. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of them didn't know it, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, then we had native people, indigenous people from South America where they had a history of mines and all the way into the southwest another mine and the native, some of those people were there by the way uh, and this was on a reservation and in uh, northern Wisconsin and uh, then all the way to Canada up to Alaska and every time it was a path of destruction they did not hire local people they brought in people. They, they did not clean up. They did not, uh, they just destroyed the community. Uh, there was prostitution, there was drugs, there was everything going on after they left. And, they, and there's an, an, another one going, we got, we're fighting right now uh, at the headwaters of another river, the Bad River, which is on a, the Bad River Reservation. So it's never ending. So the, I, I'm, this, I'm going to repeat this. The price of justice is eternal vigilance, and justice is just us. <laughs> and uh, so we, it, it's something we have to think about.